locked in my basement tomorrow, and that is no fun indeed. Okay, move this thingy out of the way. Okay, so there we go. Participants can see my screen. Yes, that was the point. It's called screen share, not screen keep. All right, welcome back. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we had some questions to start off with about homework, so I thought maybe a good place to begin would just be kind of go over each section of the homework that is currently due. It is due Monday, so a few more days uh, left with that. Um, section one of the homework is asking you to estimate an empty model, whereas example three, that the rest of the homework follows, does not have an empty model in it. However, you've done this before. So your homework two had an empty model, and otherwise you can ex take example three and cut out all of the predictors from the model statement, and you will have an empty model. So just to remind you that you do you have done that before. So the, the purpose of an empty model is to tell us how much variance there is to be had in an outcome. So if you've done it right, the variance that you get for your outcome variable just from running descriptive statistics should be the same thing as the residual variance that you get from your output. And the mean of the outcome should be the same thing as the fixed intercept because that is what it's that is what it is providing to you as a naive starting point where the best guess for everyone's outcome is the mean and all of the deviations from the actual scores about the mean then form the variance. And so it's not variance left over, but it becomes variance left over after you add predictors. So that's section one. So that's basically a review from what we've done before. And then section two is asking you to practice including a four category predictor of our outcome. So in this case, we have one control group and we have training in mini golf, training in regular golf, and training in both at the same time. So that is somewhat analogous to on slide nine here, how we have a control group and three kinds of treatments. So not a coincidence, by the way, this is the, the necessary scaffolding, hopefully, to be able to set up the problem. And we also talked about this for one of the formative assessments, the idea of if you have four groups, what does the model tell you directly and what doesn't the model tell you directly? So just to review the idea of the coding, the instructions for section two of your homework said to make the control group the reference. And so that is exactly the same as what I have here. By make that the reference, what I mean specifically is the three new predictor variables that you need to make need to have a value of zero if someone is in the control group. So then their predicted outcome is given exclusively by the fixed intercept of the model. And then each of the other predictors is essentially like a switch that turns on if we're talking about that alternative group. So everything is relative to the controls or reference. The predictor slopes that are estimated to show the effect of each of these new predictors then tell you how the group coded one differs from the group coded zero. So then the trick is just keeping track of which group is currently being coded one. So if you use my labeling system right here, like D1 meaning difference for treatment one, D2, you can label your variables however you'd like. So when you put those three new predictor variables in the model, so just the three variables in the model, the original group variable does not go in the model, we're done with it at this point. When you put in these three new predictor variables, the slopes that are estimated will directly tell you how each of those groups coded one differs from the control group coded zero. So some of the group differences that the questions ask about in section two are given to you by default in your output just from estimating the model. So you get by default just from estimating the model the mean for the group that's the reference, which is the control here, and you get the mean differences of how the group coded one differs from the group coded zero. Okay, with me so far. So then moving to the next page then, or actually not yet, it's probably advantageous it didn't want to move. I think, yeah, I have it at the top of the next page as I knew I would need that. Come on, PowerPoint, you can do it. All right, we're there. I love it when my computer feels as sluggish as I do. <laughs> it's like, 
Come on, brain. You've got this up there somewhere. You can do it. But here are the ingredients, this table up here, for how you would get the predicted outcome, which would be number of golf strokes, for instance, for each of the other groups. And so these three, the predicted means for each of the treatment groups, these are linear combinations. So that means that you will need to ask for those via extra lines of code. You can use the coefficients in the model to compute what they should be, but you won't be able to get the right standard errors unless you actually do it through the program. So it's always nice to check your intuition as to whether you have it correct by doing the math yourself, but the standard errors are gonna be more involved. So the statements that you need to be able to get the means for the three other groups, it's either estimate if you're using SAS, LINCOM if you're using STATA, or GLHT if you're using R. And there are examples of all of those for the three group case. I'm asking you to extend those examples to the four group case in your homework. So then in terms of the possible group differences, given that the control group is the reference, everything in the model is gonna tell you something about the control group. What its mean is is the fixed intercept, how each of the one groups differs from control is given by the slopes. That means the questions that ask you about differences among the non-control groups, the groups that are coded one in your predictor variables, then to get those, you will need to write estimate LINCOM or GLHT statements. And if you got this part correct already in terms of how to get the mean for each group, then you can literally subtract the lines of code for the group that's after the versus minus the group that's before, and you will get the right combination of zeros and ones. So that math is done for you down here, for instance. Can you say again which one goes first? The one that goes first if you're doing the subtraction is the second group. So okay. like if I have treatment one versus treatment two, it's the treatment two mean minus the treatment one mean. So if I have this right here, for instance, then the, the equation to get me the treatment two mean would have a one next to the intercept. It would have a zero next to beta one. It would have a one next to beta two, and it would have a zero next to beta three. And so it reduces just to these, these two values right here. Likewise, the treatment one mean has a one next to the intercept, a one next to beta one, and zeros otherwise. And so then when you take the treatment two mean line and subtract from it the treatment one mean line, you can go, you know, one minus one, the intercept drops. You know, one minus zero leaves you with a one, or uh, zero minus one leaves you with a negative one. So the, the mean lines give you what you will need to get the mean differences. But more, uh, more straightforwardly, the pattern that it takes is the slope for the group that is second minus the slope for the group that is first. That's how it works out in the end. Because beta two tells me how far treatment two is from control. Beta one tells me how far treatment one is from control. So then to get how far treatment one is from treatment two, it's just the difference of the two. So any of the comparisons involving the non-reference groups, those are things you have to ask for specifically with estimate, LINCOM, or GLHT. I don't think I asked for all of them though, so I would read through the questions and try to figure out which ones you have. Once you have the numbers correct, then remember that what we're predicting is golf score. So if a group has a higher mean that is bad, then that means that there is a significant cost to being trained by that method. If a group has a lower mean that is good, there is a significant benefit to being trained in that method. And so cost versus benefit, those questions are tied to the direction of the slope. Basically, is this a higher group or a lower group? And then significant versus non-significant is tied to the p-value that corresponds to that group difference. So the p-values are things that the questions did not ask directly, but they will be in the output. If you got the correct estimate and standard error, you will have the correct p-value. So you'll have to look back to your output to see which differences 
hit the level of significance, meaning that the p-value was less than the alpha of 0.05. And then we have effect size to talk about. But before I do effect size, are there any more questions on groups and group differences? Let's see. Uh, is there a reason for you naming it mean in the homework and not estimate? Um, the predicted mean, is that the question? Yes, yeah, so the question is like, uh, for the predicted mean number of strokes for both golf group, um, I mean, why is it called the mean and not the intercept? Ah, so we could use any of the following terms as synonyms, y hat, predicted outcome, expected outcome, group mean outcome, um, and conditional intercept, I would add to that list as well. Um, in the context of these sorts of group-based designs, it is more common to refer to group means rather than predicted outcomes. But in this case, they are exactly one and the same. So I'm, I'm just trying to, I think, broaden your vocabulary with respect to how you would talk about these models and read other people's results sections. I'm not trying to be confusing. But if you have questions as to what things are synonyms and what things are not, please, please feel free to ask. Um, they will not be group means anymore after we add additional predictor variables, though. Like after we, if there are other things in the, the model, then they're called adjusted group means. And so in that case, predicted outcome might be a more general term. But generally speaking, in these sorts of designs, people are focused on what are the group means and what are the group mean differences even though what that amounts to is what are the predicted outcomes and what are the slopes that create those group differences. Okay, other questions? Okay, so, we, so up to this point, then you would be able to answer all of the questions with respect to predicted outcomes slash group means, predicted outcome differences slash group mean differences, and get significance tests for those as a function of the statements that you wrote or the model output. Now the extra piece of that is effect size. And that is on slide 21, the method that I'm asking you to use. It's getting there, there we go. And I'm what I would like for you to do and what I had demonstrated in the handout, which I'll show in just a second, is how to use the t-test statistic that you get in your output and convert that to a d effect size. So the reason to do it that way is that then your effect size is completely consistent with the model that you estimated and not the data that it came from. In this specific example, when I only have one predictor in the model and there's four groups, I could compute Cohen's D directly from the data using group means and the pooled standard deviation. And that's probably something that you've had to do in other intro stat classes or in, you know, in data analyses. However, once I get to the point where I have, say, a grouping variable as a predictor like this, and then maybe some other covariates in addition, then computing D mean difference effect sizes from the data is not going to lead you to the same answer as D mean difference effect sizes from the model because the model is controlling for other stuff. In addition, um, the model gives you, if you've asked for those additional T test statistics for the, the mean differences between the non-reference groups, then you can get Ds for those too. So being able to take your model output and convert it into an effect size, I feel like is a more useful general strategy. There's two ways to do this. One is to get out your calculator <laughs> and feed in the t-test statistic that's on your output divided by the denominator degrees of freedom. So the t is for the specific comparison that the question is asking about. So that will be tied to either a slope, a significance test in your output, or an estimate LINCOM or GLHT statement that asks for a non-model provided difference, and there'll be a T for that too. Uh, denominator degrees of freedom show up in the top table. That's the number of slopes you could have added, which is sample size minus number of fixed effects. However, um, 
the, the T values may be reported to only two significant digits. I think in SAS and in STATA and sometimes in R, not even that many. And it is a more precise answer if you can learn how to access the T value that is stored internally in the program and do the math on it. That way the D that you get back is more precise. And it's also easier than typing a bunch of numbers into a calculator or into Excel. So where that is, I will show you in just a second, but are there uh, questions about what D means or why it's useful? Because that's important too. D is an effect size in its standard deviation units, how far apart two groups are, and why it's necessary to compute in addition to the significance tests is because whether or not a given slope or group mean difference in this context is significant has to do with two things, effect size and sample size. It also has to do with alpha, but that one's more obvious. So if I have a mean difference that's labeled significant, it could be because it's a very strong difference, or it could be because I have a lot of power because I have a lot of people. So an effect size is provided to contextualize your significance and your non-significance. Um, it may be the case that if you're doing like a pilot study of 10 people, let's say, you're not going to have significance of anything, but you can still compute an effect size to at least have a sense of how many people you might need to have in order for a given effect size to be significant. Um, it'll be a noisy effect size, but you can still use that as a starting spot. So effect sizes are necessary to contextualize significant results and describe just how big the effect is in a metric that has nothing to do with the metrics of the variables and has nothing to do with your sample size. So how we can get T's or R's then for the three group example, let me back up a little bit. Using the saved values, this is page five of example three. Example three, right? Yes, that's right. that sounds correct. Um, now we're not at four, right? This is three. <laughs> I need to look. I'm getting confused across my classes. Sorry, we started four in the other class today. So, all right, I got it. So what is happening then? I'll show this to you by package because it looks a little bit different. Scrolling up, I lied, we have to start at an earlier spot. Okay, this is page four. If you're using SAS, you can add these two lines of code to your model. They go before the run, so they're within the same analysis. And what that is going to do is save the results of all of these estimate statements that I wrote to generate predicted means and predicted mean differences into a SAS data set. That data set is going into the work library and it's called class estimates. Um, class, because working class was the variable for this example, you can call it whatever you want. You can keep the same name, it won't matter. So then that table of output is saved as a data set. So it's not the output that's displayed, it's the output that was internally constructed. So it has more precision. So it is, This table right here is what we're starting from that has this T value. And from there, you can take this code and use it directly as is. The only thing you have to change to make this work is that value right here. If that's the D value and this is the same, uh, this is how you would make an R, but I only asked for D in this case. So this line right here refers to the intercept rows because I had predicted income right here and I don't need effect sizes for that. So this is just saying, get rid of those rows. I don't need them. If it throws an error, you can just delete it and you'll get extra pieces of output that you can just ignore. But it's the D's effect size is two times the value of T. So T value is the name of the column that SAS stored the results in for the T test statistic. And then square root, this is denominator degrees of freedom. So you'll need to change this to be consistent with your data set. And each of you has a different sample size, so it won't be the same number across your, your analyses. So you'll need to change that one number. And then you can run 
this code to generate a printout of what that new data set that's been saved and modified looks like. And your D new D variable should show up at the end. And so this two right here, two times T value, mm -hmm. that's sample size minus the number of fixed effects. That's no. Uh, this is the numerator of the formula. Two and times it'll T. always be two? Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be two. It's, okay. It is right here. 2t is the numerator of the formula. Uh, That's where it, it comes from. So it's always 2. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that one is that one is the constant. So 2t is the constant. It's the number inside the square root here that needs to change because that's your denominator degrees of freedom. And you can make an r2 if you want, but I didn't ask for it in this assignment. I just wanted you to have an example of how to do it. Okay, so SAS users, does that help? Okay, state users, you're gonna like this. You don't have to change anything. Go into the stata example three uh, dot do syntax file and paste this in. <laughs> because it is accessing the staged results without you actually having to go to the trouble to save them. Um, this is something that I'm recently learning how to do better in stata. After you run an analysis, all of the pieces of the analysis are automatically saved in its working memory until you run the next analysis in which they're dumped and the new results are saved in. So that's why I have these statements three times is because it's going to do this and then immediately use the, the saved results that correspond to that value. And so our estimate is the name internally of where the estimate is, is saved RSE is the name internally. And if I have estimate over SE, what is that? If I take my slope estimate and divide by a standard error, what have I created? Looking for a letter that's used in the formula for D. Estimate over standard error is what? B. E? T, yeah. And the reason that I had to do it this way is because Stata doesn't save T directly. So I recreated it. So the interior part of this function is the T value that corresponds to that slope estimate. I then multiply it by two same two that we use in SAS. And then I divide by the square root of the degrees of freedom, which it has saved as well internally. So you don't have to change anything. So in Stata, you can write these LinCom statements to get each of your differences and then just paste in, you only need one of them, paste it in after each one and run it and then you'll get the results sequentially for each one. Okay. Questions from Stata users? All right. And then R users. This piece right here. <laughs> this is something that you also do not have to change so long as you've named things the same way that I did. So save class and model class are objects that I saved in estimating the model in R. Scroll up a little bit. So model class is what I called the analysis in the first place. And then save class is the results of get doing GLHT statements to get the missing means and mean differences. I save that into pred class. I saved pred class into save class. Um, it's a convoluted way of making sure I got what I wanted out of the output. If you name things the same way that I did, you don't need to change anything though. Alternatively, find and replace is your best friend if you did decide to rename your objects to be consistent with your variables. So then it is accessing internally the t-test statistic from the save class option, and it's also accessing internally the denominator degrees of freedom from the model. So you don't have to do anything different just generate those D values. And then the very last piece of this concatenates the saved results together so that you get all of the columns at the same time. 
and I had subset it to just rows four to six because the first three rows were means and I only wanted mean differences. But you should be able to just borrow this code and run it to get your D values because all of the results are saved internally in R every time you save an analysis as an object. Okay, questions on any of that stuff, D's, T's, etc. Should we talk about quadratics, since that's the last section? So then I asked you to predict golf scores from enthusiasm, uh, hypothesizing a nonlinear effect of enthusiasm. Uh, the effect that I hypothesized was essentially if you don't give a shit that's not going to go well for your golf. And also, if you care too much, right, if you stress yourself out, that's not going to go well. Some kind of mid-range enthusiasm would be optimal for generating a good mini golf score. So you had to center enthusiasm. I believe it was a 1 to 100 scale, and you had to center it at 25, I think. So you would follow uh, the code here to center your own variables. Um, remember that the name that goes before the equal sign is the new column you're going to generate. So you cannot use the same names that are already in your data. The name that goes to the right of the equal sign is a, the name of a column that does exist in the data. So those have to match exactly um, with the case in Stata and in R. So we make a new variable, we center it, and then the first model here was a linear model. So we'll skip over that because I didn't ask you to do one of those. You did those in your second homework. And the next model on page seven here is the quadratic model. And you don't need to do any of this. <laughs> Ignore it. All you need to do is estimate the model with enthusiasm centered at 25 in a at linear effect, so putting it in as a predictor by itself, and then putting in the squared term. That's all you have to do, because I did not ask for any predicted outcomes or predicted linear instantaneous slopes. If you take longitudinal analysis with me at some point, you will get a chance to practice this, because putting in quadratic effects of time is a very common strategy for modeling nonlinear change. So in SAS, the new quadratic squared variable is the original variable with an asterisk between the two. In Stata, it is a hashtag slash pound sign. And in R, it is this thing right here, capital letter I, and then in parentheses, the variable that you want, and then a caret, and then the two. So squared is how you say that right there. And then all of the output that answers the questions would come from what is provided directly. You don't have to ask for anything. The only catch in terms of interpretation is figuring out which type of pattern that you have. And they pull up a slide on that. Just a moment here. Come on, you can do it. There we go, we're getting there. Looking for a picture, this one. Come on. Slide 27, kinds of quadratics. So you would look at the sign of the linear effect at centered at 25 and the sign of the quadratic to figure out which pattern you have. If your slope, if your linear slope is positive and your quadratic slope is positive, then what's happening is that you have a slope that is increasing as a function of the variable. So it, so the effect of enthusiasm is stronger at higher levels in that case, if that's the combination that you have is positive, positive. If it's a positive linear slope and a negative quadratic, then you have a positive slope that is slowing down. So enthusiasm matters less as you go along and eventually becomes a, a, a negative relationship if you keep following the curve out here. 
if you have a negative linear slope paired with a positive quadratic, then you have a negative slope of enthusiasm that's becoming less negative as, as it goes on and eventually becomes positive. And if they're both negative slopes, then you have a negative slope that is accelerating, that is becoming more negative as you go along the variable. And the trick to interpreting quadratic coefficients correctly is to multiply them by two. Twice the quadratic is how the linear slope changes per unit x. The quadratic slope itself is half the rate of acceleration or deceleration, so you have to multiply it by two to get to the full rate of acceleration or deceleration. Okay, and that should be the end of your homework. What you'll get a chance to do in the next homework, which is not done yet, so that's on me to get that ready for you, is to practice uh, piecewise models and we'll see what else I decide to throw in there. That's the stuff we were talking about on Tuesday. So I think I hit all of the items that were mentioned at the top of class. Does anyone have other questions or things that they want to talk about? Am I frozen? No? Just no questions? Yeah, it's, ambig it's ambiguous to me, which it is, right? <laughs> it's either I understand perfectly or I can't hear you. Th those faces look the same on Zoom. But... I think I understand enough to finish my homework. Enough to finish your homework. Well, that is a great goal. It's always a process, right? Being able to do it and have the confidence that the numbers turn green is one thing. Being able to do it in life is as yet another skill set that we're working our way towards. So, all right. Then, so we did piecewise models last time, uh, just to review the concept of that very briefly. Uh, piecewise slopes, or what is known as linear splines, those are useful for taking a quantitative predictor and carving it up into sections and fitting a separate linear slope through each section that corresponds to an overall nonlinear trajectory. Uh, you have to know where the breakpoints are. They're called knots in order for this to work. There are other models that you can ask it to find where the breakpoints are. Those are more complicated to estimate. But in this example, what I did is carve up years of education into a section that is for less than high school, meaning that people um, from second grade to 11th grade education, another section that goes from 11 to 12 that corresponds to the bump from graduating high school, and then a third section that corresponds to more education among people who've at least graduated high school. And so what the results suggested, as you can kind of tell from the picture what's going to happen, the slope going from second grade to 11th grade was non-significant. It was actually negative, but very, but very close to zero. There was a significantly positive slope for the bump between 11th and 12th, and there was a significantly positive slope for years of education out here, although this one's kind of suspect because it doesn't look like the model fit uh, that predicted set of means very well. So this is just an example of how you could take a quantitative variable that includes both kinds of people and amounts of something and kind of carve it up to get at both of those aspects simultaneously. Um, would it be possible to have gotten a slope that overlaps with another predictor? Like up to 12th grade and 11th to 12th and, af and after 12th? Um, yes. So there, there is another way to set up these sorts of models that would give you like a constant linear slope through the whole thing. Like if you just put in education, like the original variable centered at 12 or something, or centered at 11 to keep it consistent. And then you put in, say, the second slope and the third slope with it. So there's that overlap. What the second slope and the third slope would then mean is a deviation from the main slope. So it's directly tests whether or not the slope changes after a knot point. And that would be useful anytime that you have an expectation that there is a relationship and what you want to capture is a difference in the relationship as a function of something else. 
So piecewise models um, and longitudinal data, for example, let's say that you're doing an intervention design in elementary school children. If you did nothing, children are supposed to learn, right? That's called school. That's what should be happening anyway. Not that, you know, they want to necessarily be learning. Of course, my son has decided he hates school right now, primarily because they don't have Nintendo there. So he's not a happy camper. But even in this control condition with nothing special happening, he's still learning. Um, this week he's doing minusing because he's working on minusing and timesing. So he hasn't done a dividing yet. He's working his way there. But in, an, in the, the, the agnostic case where you're doing nothing special, like children would be expected to grow and they learn more over time. Well, if you're going to do an intervention type design where you want to test out a new way of making them grow faster, then these sorts of models, like what you would do is fit like a linear slope for the control group and then have an overlapping slope that splits off after the treatment started that directly tests how the slope changes after that point. And then the efficacy of your treatment would be described as how much more the treatment kids grow than the control kids grew. But they're both growing the whole time because there's that constant expectation. So if you had that kind of thing, like if you expect there to be a relationship, but you think there's a different relationship after some point, then coding the model that way would directly get you those parameters as part of the model. Um, you can add them to, you'd have to add them together to figure that out from this solution. But yeah, the, the bottom line is you can set these up in many different ways and they would tell you slightly different things as a function of how you set it up but you can always use estimate LINCOM and GLHT linear combinations to get whatever is not directly provided by the model. It's a long answer. I'm not sure if that answered the question. Maybe. That thumbs up. Okay, that's close enough. Okay, other questions on this example before I switch gears a little bit? Just a little bit though. Okay, so another instance in which a piecewise type model for this can be useful is in examining whether or not you can treat an ordinal predictor as if it's interval. So for example, let's say that I'm predicting income still in the same general social survey sample, and I have a variable that is level of happiness that a, a respondent reported. And your choices are, one is unhappy, two is neither happy nor unhappy, three is fairly happy, four is very happy, and five is completely happy. So are those numbers? Not really, yeah. A uh, question from before, if the control is kept separate, why do we need to do the piecewise model? Um, you would have to put both the control group and the treatment group into the same analysis in order to test whether the slope changed after the treatment started. Anytime that you want to compare effect sizes across different variables or different groups or both, everything has to be together in the same analysis to get all of the standard errors needed to do that simultaneously. Okay, does that answer that question? Okay, so yeah. So this variable happiness is not really numbers, but we might be tempted to treat it as if it's a quantitative variable. For instance, if we found that the average of this variable was like three and a half, then we could say, well, on average, people are somewhere between fairly happy and very happy. And that seems like it might be a reasonable thing to do. But whether or not you can treat an ordinal predictor as if it's interval essentially boils down to whether or not there is the same slope in relating that predictor to an outcome as you go between each separate category. So if the change in predicted income from unhappy to neither is the same as the change in predicted income from neither to fairly happy, then a linear slope through these values would be okay, even though they're not numbers. So I wanna show you how to test whether or not the same slope is operating all the way through these groups such that you can kind of think of it as a number that a linear slope is a reasonable approximation for the relationship. So to do this, we're going to use a different style of dummy coding 
which is known as sequential coding in your textbook and it uses zeros and ones like we did in the four group example, but in a slightly different way. So here's what this will look like in a setup. All right, let me make this big for a second. There we go. So I have in this variable five distinct categories of happiness. That's like I have five groups. And if I have five groups, how many slopes do I need? Yep, I need four. So that part hasn't changed, but it's up to me how to set up those new predictors so that I can dictate what I want the slopes to tell me. So rather than treating one group as the reference and then looking at the difference of how each other group varies from that reference, I'm going to set it up to be like a moving window kind of thing. So I'm setting the reference to be one. So the model intercept is going to tell me what the predicted outcome is for people who say they're one for happy. And the first slope is going to be coded one if they're greater than a value of two. The second slope is going to be coded a one if there's a greater than a value of three. And then the, the third one is greater than four. And then the last one is if it's greater or equal to five rather. So then when you put this all together, what these slopes are going to tell you is the jump in the predicted outcome as you move from each category. So I've named these in a way that conveys what they mean. H1 versus two. When all four of these variables are in the model as predictors at the same time, this one's going to tell me how the two code differs from the one code. The next one's going to tell me how three differs from two, and then how four differs from three, and then how five differs from four. So it's kind of like a piecewise model where each difference has its own little slope. The itsy bitsy spider of coding. So it's going to directly capture each of these little line segments. And then I can ask it whether each of those little line segments have an equivalent slope. If they do, then a linear model is a reasonable thing. If they don't, then it's not. Okay. How are we doing on that as an idea? So this is a different style of coding than what we did for the golf in your homework and what we did for the working class variable earlier in this lecture. Now here's the difference. It boils down to what happens in these off cells. So on the bottom of the screen is what the dummy coding scheme looked like when we were doing indicator coding, which is telling us how each group differs from the reference group. The the group that is not a focus of the slope is coded zero in this case, whereas the value doesn't go back to zero, it stays at one in each of these alternatives. So this creates a stepwise type function where this variable is going to give us zero versus or one versus two, but then this one fills in the, the gap of where the switch happens from zero to one. So they'll tell us the difference acutely wherever this difference ha is because all of the other ones then are redundant. So the unique effect of each of these variables is just that transition point where zero changes to one. So that type of coding scheme makes more sense for ordinal variables where you might wanna look at what is the impact of being in the next category up. It makes more sense than just coding it relative to a single reference group um, given that there's a natural ordering to things. So here's what happens, and then I'll show you the code to, to make it happen in just a moment. So in this overall model, oh, come back. Here's my F test statistic. So in English, what is this box telling me? I'll give you a second to encode. So we have an F of 1.25, corresponds to a mean square error of about 190, a p-value of 0.29, and an R-square of 0.007.
degrees of freedom. It is telling me that. That's what's inside the parentheses here. So four degrees of freedom in the numerator and 200 and, or nine, <laughs> I can't read numbers at this point. Hang on, I need more Mountain Dew. 729, that's what that says. I'm not sure at what point in the day I stop wanting more caffeine and I start wanting more wine, but I think I'm heading close to that breaking point. See, there's a piecewise model, right? Extra caffeine versus I give up. Uh, sample size of 733, very close. It's actually 734 because what's not being counted is the intercept. So the, the denominator degrees of freedom is sample size minus number of total parameters, which is intercept plus four slopes in here. Yeah. So yeah, just this part is telling me I have a model with four slopes in it and one intercept, which means that I have a sample of 734. Okay. Uh, what's the next piece telling me? F statistic, yes, it is a test statistic. F is greater than one. Is that good or bad? That is good if I want my model to be worth, worth something. So that means that per slope, I have explained more information than I would expect to explain on average per slope I haven't estimated yet. So remember my, my Coles analogy from a few weeks ago? F is saying, did I get a good deal? Like if I have my shopping bag of all my clearance things that I found and I have however much money I spent on it, the amount of stuff I bought is like sums of squares model. The amount of money I spent is numerator degrees of freedom. So it's like how much did each thing cost on average? That's the numerator of F. And then, well, how do I know if that's a good deal is relative to how much would I expect things to cost at Kohl's, right? Because Kohl's is a cheap store for the most part, so I would expect good deals as a matter of course. But if it's a really good deal, then I should spend less per item than what I could have spent buying anything else left in the store. So then the denominator of F sums of squares residual is all the stuff that's left in the store and then how much money it would have taken to buy it all is like de denominator degrees of freedom. So F being above one tells me that I got a better deal in terms of what my slopes captured than what I would expect any other slopes to capture that I haven't added yet overall. Yeah. Okay. Is that, but how good is it? I need some more words to, to quantify this because 1.25, it's like, if you want to explain to somebody what that means, be like, is that what? Mm -hmm. Well, um, is it significant? Let's start there. Does anything in this box tell me whether or not that F is significant? Good but not great? Yeah, I'll take those words. It is not because of P. What should P be in order to declare something significant? And I'm using my air quotes for that. Yeah, it should be less than 0.05. So P is evaluated relative to the alpha level that you have set at the beginning of the study, which is your type one error. How often are you willing to have a false alarm? Standard is 5% of the time. So this p-value would say that we would get a result like this. If all four slopes were zero in the population, we'd see slopes that were this big, like 29% of the time. So yeah, not exceptional at all. But then it's like, well, maybe you just don't have enough power and that's why you have a non-significant result and I'm not gonna publish your paper. Is power the issue? Because anytime that you have a non-significant result, it could be because of two reasons. Not enough power is one of them. What's the other? Uh, sample size would be related to power. So the more people, the more power. So that's definitely one factor, but what's the other? You can have a non-significant result because of what other contributing factor? That's also in the box, by the way. <laughs> which is why it's in the box. Effect size. R square of 0 0.007. That means that putting in my four slopes 
captured less than 1% of the total variability. And that that amount of variability captured, explained, is not significantly different than zero. So this is why we have these two things together in talking about a model, and it's also why we would go to the trouble to compute an effect size for each p-value that we talk about with respect to the slope. Because you can have something be significant because you have a lot of people, or it could be significant because you have a strong effect, and you have to de delineate which of those it might be or both. So yeah, I would answer a reviewer, yeah, it's, the reason that it's not significant is because it's a crappy model. Like, happiness is not related to income in this sample. And I have 734 people. It's not a lack of power. It's a lack of effect size. So then if we boil down the actual results to what we got here, here is the model that I fit. So beta 0 is what again? What's that thing known as? Looking for a verbal label and a definition. That's my intercept. Yep. Fixed intercept, yes. I say fixed because it's a constant. In other classes I teach, it's a variable instead. That's called a random intercept if it's a variable. But it's a fixed intercept. Yep. What does it mean? Yep. It's the predicted outcome when the x's are zero. So then I, to know what it means, I have to look at what else is in my model. So when these variables are all zero is when somebody said that they have a one rating on happiness, meaning that they're unhappy. So unhappy people are predicted to make $15,000 a year and some change. So that's the, the mean for this group at this point right here. Beta one then, given my coding scheme, tells me how the two group differs from the one group. They are higher by 1.69, but the standard error for that difference is three, so it's definitely not significant. Beta two, given my coding scheme, then gets me from the two group to the three group. That slope is negative, also not significant. Beta three in my coding scheme gets me from the three group to the four group. That slope is significant, actually. And then beta 4 gets me from 4 to 5, and that slope is also non-significant. Yeah. So here's a question. I have a significant result right here. Right there. P less than 0.05. You see it? Right there. Or eat, or eat, or eat, or eat, or eat. <laughs> So if I have a significant slope in here, why is my model not significant? That hardly seems fair. Any ideas on that? The rest of them are not significant, yeah. Because F is a per slope index. So imagine if I had you do group work I used to hate group work when I was in school. And what if you worked really hard on something and you had three people in your group who did nothing? How good of a project are you going to have? <laughs> Not great, because the three may drown out the, the, the one. So just because I have one slope that's significant, it is being downweighted by the other three that are not significant. F is per slope. So it's being penalized as a consequence of that. Uh, the next unit that we have that we'll start uh, next week is looking at what happens when you put multiple predictors into the same model. And the same thing can happen. If you have one really good predictor but eight shitty ones, like the, the average contribution could be non-significant because the good one is being drowned out. Good grade, bad attitude. Yeah. <laughs> and resentment from the people in the group who are actually doing the work, as it were. But anywho. So then the question we set out to answer, can we just draw a line through this and call it good? Can we treat this ordinal variable as interval? 
The answer to that question boils down to whether the transitions here are the same. So that's the, the linear combination results that I have at the bottom here. How different is the beta 2 slope than the beta 1 slope? Not different. How different are these two? Not different. How different are these two? Um, kind of close. So in this case, the conclusion that I would come to is, yeah, these slopes aren't different, so you could probably just draw one line, but that one line is still flat. So either way you look at it, happiness is not related to income. But going through this sort of piecewise incremental process can allow you to address whether or not you can treat a variable as interval and just draw one slope through it. Hmm. Summary. We made it. <laughs> no, we didn't. I haven't shown you the code yet. I can't get ahead of myself. Let's look at the code real quick. And then we can uh, call it a day. So sequential or piecewise coding, that's the idea here. So we did piecewise slopes for education last time. Show this real quick. Um, keep going. Here we go. Keep going. Effect sizes. So more code demonstrating effect sizes for that. And here we go. So the first model is this is page 14 of example three. Um, fitting a linear slope through happy just by centering it one, pretending like it's a quantitative variable that's interval. So you already know how to do that. In this model, we have one slope that was estimated as 0.74, not significant. So basically a flat line predicting uh, income from happiness. And then the coding to do the, the sequential dummy coding. It looks a lot more compact in SAS because you can lump multiple con commands that follow a condition together. So here's the SAS code on page 15 that would correspond to this. Step one, make the new predictor variables and set them to be missing. So make them empty. And then for each potential value of the categorical predictor, say what's going to happen to each of my new variables. So I want to make happy equals one my reference category for the model that the intercept is going to cover. So I set all four new variables to zero. And note, SAS users, the semicolon after each one. I've helped several people troubleshoot this. Um, you'll know that you're forgetting one, by the way, if this end is not blue. If the colors are wrong, that means you've forgotten a semicolon somewhere. That's almost always what it means. Um, alternatively, you may have a quote that is, doesn't have a matching end quote. That will make your colors turn wrong too. So then if happy equals two, these are the values, happy equals three, and so forth. So this matches what's happening in the table that I made to demonstrate the logic of the code. In Stata, I'm using greater than two, three, four, five to shorten the number of distinct lines that I have to write. So the conditionality is at the end of these statements in Stata. So replace the variable if this is true. And in R, I'm doing the same thing uh, with the which inside here giving the conditionality. So if the original variable is this, then do this, do whatever to each of the variables to be made. And then here is this here. So I'm in the habit of starting new variables and setting them empty and then adding in the zeros and ones so that I don't have to explicitly account for missing data. So in this case, if a given case doesn't meet any of these conditions, the new variables will just stay blank. Otherwise, if you initialize them to zero, for instance, then and you have missing data, then they won't become unzero. It's better to start with them being missing and then fill them in systematically based on whatever data you have. That way you don't accidentally assume anything. And so then those new variables go inside the model statements as usual. And then the slope differences, here's an example of how one would do that. The, so for in, in these sorts of statements, the two slopes to be compared, for instance, the slope that goes from one to two 
is being compared against the slope that goes from 2 to 3. The one that is listed before the versus gets the minus 1 in the code, and the one that is listed after gets the 1. So the setup of this will look exactly the same in the golf homework whenever you're testing mean differences between the non-reference groups. The second one gets the 1, the first one gets the minus 1. It always works out that way. If you switch them, then you will get the right result, but the wrong sign. The p-value and the standard error will be the same, though. And so then in Stata, they go right in there. And then in R, they go in here. And then the only difference is that in R, you have to tell it what to do with all the other fixed effects. And so the ones that are not involved in the comparisons are left to be 0 but it's the same minus one, one, minus one, one pattern. And so then here's all the results that we just went over on the slide, and then some code to do the effect sizes. So in this case, I'm doing an R effect size because it's in a correlation metric. And so here are the corresponding effect sizes for the four sequential slopes. They're all really tiny. So none of them is significant. It's not because we have low power, it's because it's a very small effect size and probably not worth powering. And the rest of this looks pretty much the same. And that's it. Now we made it. <laughs> Hooray. There. That is really the end. Okay. So there, there's the big picture summary. I know. Confetti. So predictor variables that are categorical need number of categories minus one slopes to fully recreate all of their individual means. It's up to you how to set up the slopes though. So if you have a nominal predictor, so there's no order to it, indicator coding where each slope turns on one of the groups relative to the reference is a good strategy. If you have ordinal variables, um, it might be more useful to do this sequential approach where you get the, the adjacent differences as you move up the ordinal variable. For each difference, you'll want to report both significance and effect size so that you can describe how big the difference is, not just whether or not it meets your cutoff. Uh, Nonlinear effects of quantitative predictors, we can do quadratic slopes, exponential slopes, piecewise slopes. So if you hypothesize that as x increases, y stops increasing at some point, those kinds of hypotheses require nonlinear functions. And we would want to report the significance and effect size of the model as well as each individual slope, where f tells us whether or not we have a significant prediction, and r squares the effect size for how good the model is at predicting the outcome. There. We really did make it all the way through. I think this is like part eight or something. <laughs> so where we're headed next is actually earlier in your textbook. They did it in a different order than I wanted to do it. But the idea of combining predictors that represent different things into the same model. So is there a relationship between X and Y after I control for this other thing? Those kinds of questions require you to put all the predictors of interest into the model. And the slopes that we're going to have are still slopes. There's still the change in Y for a one unit change in X, but they then will represent unique effects. So the idea of what does this predictor contribute to predicting the outcome uniquely that the others don't? So that's what is coming next week, since it is Thursday, and that means that I don't see you for five more days. And that also means that I need to get the stuff ready for next week. So no wine for me just yet until my work is done. All right, uh, questions or comments before we call it a week, not just a day, but a week. All right, then as folks are working on homework, it's due Monday night, 
Let me know if you have any questions. I have office hours starting in just a couple minutes here. Um, we also have TA office hours on Friday and then on Monday as well for last minute questions. Um, but otherwise you have all the tools you need. Just gotta sit down and do it whenever you can make time, right? And as usual, if it's late, that's okay. It's just a one point deduction, but there's nothing that you can't come back from if it doesn't work out for you to turn this in on time. So keep working, even if it isn't uh, exactly Monday, that's fine. All right, anything else? Thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here, I appreciate it. And I will see you next week. I'm sorry, just one question. In the yeah. homework, it, it shows that eight points from computation and three points from results. That becomes like... That doesn't like, sound right.